The Sign of the Lever by Elizabeth George Spear, Chapter 22. Every morning, in spite of himself, Matt kept an eye out for Tian. When four days had gone by, he decided there was little chance that he would see his friend again. Doubtless, the Indians had already left the village and were on their way north. So when he saw Atian coming through the woods with his dog at his heels, he ran across the, across the clearing to meet him, not bothering to hide his relief and pleasure. You think different? Atian asked quickly. You go with us? Matt eagerly died away. Matt's eagerness died away. No, he said unhappily. Please try to understand, Atian. I must wait for my father. Atian nodded. I understand. My grandfather understand too. I do same for my father if I if he still live. The two boys stood looking at each other. There was no amusement and no scorn in Atian's eyes. How very strange, Matt thought. After all, the brave deeds he had dreamed of to win this boy's respect, he had gained it at last just by doing nothing just by staying here and refusing to leave. My grandfather sends you gift, Atien said now. He unstrapped from his back a pair of snowshoes. They were new, the wool smooth and polished. The netting was deer hide woven in a neat design. Before Matt could find words, Atien went on. My grandmother sent gift too, he said. He took from his pouch a small birch basket of maple sugar. Late in the season like this, Matt knew sugar was scarce and dear to the Indians. Thank you, he said. Tell your grandmother that when you come back, I'll help gather more sap for her. Atien was silent. Not come back, he said then. In the spring, I mean, when the hunt is over. Not come back. Atien repeated, not live in village again. Our people find new hunting ground. But this is your home. My people hunters. My grandfather say many white men come soon. Cut down trees, make house, plant corn. Where my people hunt. Where my people hunt. What could my answer to that? He had only one argument to offer. Your grandfather wants you to learn to read, he reminded Atien. I haven't been much of a teacher, but when my family comes, it'll be different. My mother will teach you to read and to write too. Um, what for I read? My grandfather, mighty hunter. My father, mighty hunter. They not read. Your grandfather wants you to be able to understand treaties. Matt insisted. We go far away. No more white man. Not need to sign paper. An uncomfortable doubt had long been troubling Matt. Matt. Now, before Tian went away, he had to know. This land, this land, he said slowly. This place where my father built his cabin. Did it belong to your grandfather? Did he own it once? How one man own ground? Atien questioned. How one man own ground? Well, my father owns it now. He bought it. I don't understand, Atien scowled. How can man own land? Land same as air. Land for all people to live on, for beaver and deer. Does deer own land? How could you explain? Matt wondered, to someone who did not want to understand. Somewhere in the back of his mind, there was a sudden suspicion that Atian was making sense and that he was not. It was better not to talk about it. Instead, he asked, where will you go? My grandfather say much forest where sun go down. White man not come so far. To the west, Matt had heard his father talk about the west. There was good land there for the taking. Some of their neighbors in Quincy had chosen to go west instead of buying land in Maine. How could he tell Atien that there would be white men there too? Still, they said there's no end of land in the west. 
He reckoned there must be enough for both white man and Indians. Before he could think what to say, Atian spoke again. I give you gift, he said. Dog like you. I tell him stay with you. You mean you're not taking him with you? No, no good for hunt, Atian said. Walk, walk slow now. Good to stay here with Medebi, with white brother. Atian's careless words did not deceive Matt. He knew very well how Atian felt about that no good dog that followed him everywhere he went. And Atian had said white brother. Matt could not find the words he needed, but he knew there was something he must do. He had to have a gift for Atian, and he had nothing to give, nothing at all that belonged to him. Robinson Crusoe? What could that mean to a boy who would never now learn to read? He did have one thing. At the thought of it, something twisted tight in his stomach, but it was the only thing he had that could possibly match the gifts Atian had given him. Wait here, he told Atian. He went into the cabin and took down the tin box. The watch was ticking away inside it. He had never forgotten to wind it, even when he was too tired to notch a stick. Now he lifted it out, lifted it out and held it in his hand, the way he had held it when his father had given it to him, as though it were a fragile bird's egg. His father would never understand. Before he could think about it another minute, Matt hurried back to where Atian stood waiting. I have a gift for you, he said. It tells the time of day. I'll show you how to wind it up. Atian held the watch even more carefully. There was no mistaking that he was pleased and impressed. Probably, Matt thought, Atian would never learn to use it. The sun and the shadows of the trees told him all he needed to know about the time of day. But Atia knew that Matt's gift was important. Fine gift, he said. He put the watch very gently into his pouch. Then he held out his hand. Awkwardly, the two boys shook hands. Your father comes soon, Atia said. I hope you get the biggest moose in Maine, Matt answered. Atian turned and walked into the woods. The dog sprang up to follow him. Atian motioned him back and uttered one stern order. Puzzled, the dog sank down and put his chin between his paws. As Atian walked away, he whined softly, but he obeyed. Matt knelt down and put his hand on the dog's head. The end of chapter 22.